This video is sponsored by Chilling, the new home for scary stories. Start your free trial to experience this revolutionary new app that allows users to completely customize their listening experience. With features like the one-of-a-kind ambience menu, where you can change the background sound of the stories at any time to fit your mood, the roaring of a classic campfire, or a thunderstorm with heavy rain, the ambience menu creates maximum immersion for the stories. Create a highly customized playlist with your favorite kind of stories, and set the sleep timer to turn everything off exactly when you want. Chilling features popular narrators from YouTube and new favorites that you won't hear anywhere else. Chilling is packed full of spooky content, including short stories, classic novels, vintage horror radio, and more. Countless hours and hundreds of stories with more added every week. Start your three-day free trial then it's just $2.99 a month. And for a limited time, when you start your free trial and leave a review, you could be eligible to win an Xbox Series X bundle. Click the link in the description for details, or just search Chilling in your app store and experience a more intense way to relax. I often used the subway to go to work in the morning. One day, when I was waiting for the train, I noticed a homeless man standing in a corner of the subway station, muttering to himself as people passed by. He was holding out a cup and seemed to be begging for spare change. A fat woman passed by the homeless man and I distinctly heard him say, Pig. Wow, I thought to myself. This homeless man is insulting people and he still expects them to give him money? Then, a tall businessman went by, and the homeless guy muttered, Human. Human? I can't argue with that. Obviously, he was human. The next day, I arrived early at the subway station and had some time to kill, so I decided to stand close to the homeless man and listen to his strange mutterings. A thin, haggard-looking man passed in front of him, and I heard the homeless guy mutter, Cow. Cow? I thought. The man was much too skinny to be a cow. He looked more like a turkey or a chicken to me. A minute or so later, a fat man went by and the homeless man said, Potato. Potato? I was under the impression that he called all fat people pig. That day, at work, I couldn't stop thinking about the homeless man and his puzzling behavior. I kept trying to find some logic or pattern in what he was muttering. Perhaps he has some kind of psychic ability, I thought. Maybe he knows what these people were in a previous life. Many people believe in reincarnation. I observed the homeless man many times and began to think my theory was right. I often heard him calling people things like rabbit or onion or sheep or tomato. One day, Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to ask him what was going on. As I walked up to him, he looked at me and said, Bread. I tossed some money into his cup and asked him if he had some kind of psychic ability. The homeless man smiled and said, Yes, indeed. I do have a psychic ability. It is an ability I obtained years ago, but it's not what you might expect. I can't tell the future or read minds or anything like that. Then what is your ability? I asked eagerly. The ability is merely to know the last thing somebody ate, he said. I laughed because I realized he was right. He said bread. The last thing I had eaten for breakfast that day was toast. I walked away shaking my head. Of all the psychic abilities someone could have, that one must be the most useless. I used to live with my husband and our lovely son. However, our family was unhappy. We had always struggled with poverty ever since my son was born. At times, we suffered hunger, and it caused many arguments between us. My husband hadn't worked for 13 years and spent his days drinking. 
We were just barely getting by with whatever money I could bring. In time, we found out that our son suffered from mental health problems. However, I ended up keeping him in the house because I didn't think it was too serious. We'd never had any major accidents after all, until the incident. One day, I brought home a watermelon that I had received from one of my friends. It was sweet and delicious. After finishing the watermelon, my son was so happy. He said it was the best thing he'd ever eaten. I was pleased that I could share it with him. But no one expected the disaster it would bring. In the following weeks, he became madly obsessed with watermelons. He pestered me day after day to buy him another, and started to get angry when I told him that we just didn't have the money. Once, I woke up to him standing by the bed, staring down at me. I want to eat a watermelon! A sweet watermelon! His frantic shrieks scared me so badly. I started to take money away from our necessities just so that I could buy him a watermelon or two every day. Whenever he woke up, he would look for the watermelons and eat them. However, he kept saying that the watermelons I brought home didn't taste the same, not like the one my friend had given me. Sometimes he'd even throw away the half-eaten melons in anger and scream his rage. I felt so helpless, but still, I didn't want to take my child to a mental hospital. So... I decided to wait a little longer, hoping that his condition would improve, and it did. He started to seem a little happier, more stable again. I even got brave enough to tell him that our financial situation had worsened and that I couldn't buy watermelons for a while. He seemed to take the news with surprising patience. I was relieved. Then, one morning, I woke up to my son's screams. Where's the watermelon? Give me the watermelon! My husband and I rushed to the kitchen. I could see our son rummaging through the fridge and kitchen cabinets. When he noticed us, he started to stumble over. There was a kitchen knife in his hand. Where's my watermelon? Watermelon. A sweet watermelon. His eyes seemed to roll in his head in an unnatural, terrifying way. And then suddenly, without any warning, he stabbed my husband to the side of his head. Fresh blood splashed all over. I could just stand there in utter shock. It felt like I wasn't really there. It just couldn't be real. Then my son shouted with a white smile. I found it! That finally snapped me back to reality. I started screaming and called the police immediately. By the time they arrived, my husband was already dead. They found our son holding his head crying and mumbling that the watermelon tasted odd. When he saw me with the police, he tried to come at me with the knife too. Another watermelon. The police overpowered him and took the knife away. At that point, I just passed out. After that, my son was confined to a mental hospital. The nurses tell me that he's still trying to search for his sweet watermelon. Do not ever meet a stranger on the internet. I don't remember any happy memories in my life. My depression was getting worse day by day. I wanted to die. However, I wanted to live. It's ironic. I wanted to regain my will to live. This dying life sucked. So one day I posted on the internet, I want to commit suicide. Everybody was just saying stereotype things. Life is beautiful, love yourself, blah, blah, blah. Then suddenly, I saw someone's comment caught my eyes. I'll make you want to live for 100% sure. It was interesting. So I replied, how? Then I saw another reply. We have to meet first. That's the only way I can cure you. It's up to you to believe or not, but just keep in mind that your choice can change your life. We exchanged contacts and met soon. The man was more handsome than I thought. 
He was kind and trustworthy. He led me to his house. The house was like an abandoned one. There was nothing inside. Now it's simple. I'm going to kill you. If you want to survive, you have to kill me first. What? Are you insane? No way, I'm going home. You said you want to live. This is the best way. Just trust me. Then he took out the knife from his pocket. I said, no, don't do this to me. He forced me into grabbing his knife. I could see his eyes were already insane. Just then, he posed to fight with me. Let's fight. You've lost the meaning of life, right? You don't know why you have to live. So just fight with me. Burn your will to live. I tried to escape, but he caught me and knocked me over on the floor. If you kill me, you can live. And you get your will back to life. How is it? I'm your savior. Oh, you don't have to appreciate it. So stab me or you're dead meat. My body trembled. I've never felt this fear in my life. Hurry, stab me. He then started punching me like crazy. A massive pain rushed like a flood. I kicked him and he fell back. However, he jumped up and rushed back to me. He kept yelling at me to stab him, and this time he even bit my leg. I tore off his hair desperately to pull him off. He wouldn't stop when his hair fell out, and I could see a hole from his top of the head. He was literally like a dog, and I felt the blood flowing down my legs vividly. He didn't stop. Whenever he kept biting and hitting me, the memories of my life and all the faces of my family passed before my eyes. Being terrified, I cried and begged him, help me, I don't want to die, please. Then he stopped and stared at me. This time, I knelt down and begged again. Do you want to live? Yes, please, please. His expression slowly changed mildly. See, you are saved. Now, you do want to live. Yes, now I am all good. I want to live. Please let me go. He looked at me quietly and said with a smug look on his face as if he had done something great. Hey, remember, I saved your life. So don't you dare call the cops. Then he left. After that, it took me a long time to get back to my daily routine after getting treatment. I've been hospitalized and I'm also still in psychiatric care. I eventually ended up reported to the police and they tracked him. Then he was found stabbed and horribly murdered at home. It turned out this man was stabbed to death while assaulting another person. The person who stabbed him was also seriously injured and is now in critical condition. According to the police, more than 18 people have been found to have been assaulted by this man so far. One day, I saw a posting on this website. The writer continued to post once every week for several years. It was a long story of a woman he was looking for, including a picture of her face, her age, her characteristics, etc. He insisted that they were a married couple, but one day, she suddenly went missing. He said it's been nine years since then. Saying that he did everything to find her, he was finally appealing with this. He said he would give $10,000 to whoever found her. While reading his posting, I found out that the neighborhood where the woman lived was the same area as mine. I thought maybe I've seen her somewhere, so I sent him a message saying that I could help. I soon got a reply from him. If you find her, I'll give you money or whatever you want. I looked at her picture and went out to find the traces based on what he had told me. The restaurants, bars, parks, etc. I went everywhere she used to go and found out if anyone looked similar to her. However, it eventually all been for nothing. I ended up giving up and forgot about it. 
Several seasons passed since then, and autumn came. While walking down the street, I saw a woman passing by me who looked really familiar. Feeling strange, I suddenly stopped in the spot and looked back at her. Obviously, she wasn't someone I knew, so then... Just then, the lightning seemed to strike my head. She was the one that the man was looking for. I called out to her, my heart pounding in the moment. She asked me what was that about, and I explained the whole story to her. After that, I could see her facial expression frown. And to my surprise, what she told me was a total shock. The man was just a guy who she met at a bar ten years ago. Just one day, just a few hours. Those two were not in a relationship and had never been married. He was just a stranger. However, he kept looking for her for over 10 years. Well, it's horrifying. She eventually got mad and left. I got a number from her just in case, and that's when I started agonizing. Maybe I could receive the $10,000 if I tell him. I started to search the mailbox and soon found his address. I wrote down a whole story about what had happened that day. The next day, I got a reply from him saying that it's for sure his wife and he wanted to know her phone number. At first, I didn't want to tell him since I was kind of worried about her, but he kept contacting me. If you tell me your number in the right place where you met her, I'll give you that money, I promise. Being blinded by money, I ended up giving him information. Eventually, he sent the money. I honestly couldn't believe it. After that... I forgot about it again and everything seemed to be as normal. Then, one day, I heard from a friend that a woman was horribly murdered in our neighborhood. And the next part of the story made me feel weak at the knees and fall down on the spot. The criminal was the same guy who had been searching for her for 10 years. I ran frantically to the computer and logged onto the website where he wrote his posting. And there was a new post written by him. Finally, I found her. I clicked on it and started to read. With the help of my friend who I met in this community, I was finally able to find her. Although she didn't recognize me, it was okay, because I remembered her. When I kissed her, she hit me in the face, and her reaction made me go crazy. I couldn't believe this was the result of waiting ten years. With a blaze of anger, I decided to get her out of my head. However, I failed. I couldn't get her out of my mind. During these ten years, I haven't forgot about her for a single day. So I made the inevitable choice. If I can't get her out of my head, then I would get rid of her in real life. If she doesn't exist in the real world, that means she doesn't exist in my head anymore, right? I was in shock. And when I clicked my mailbox, I found another email from him. He told me to return the money he had sent, insisting that our deal was invalid. His reasoning was that she was no longer the same woman he was looking for because she had already changed. I never actually replied to him, but he kept sending emails. I will find you, and I will make you the same as her. Please look forward to it, my friend. I eventually ended up calling the police and they started searching for him. A few days later, another eye-catching posting was put on the website. I'm looking for a guy who I love. It said that someone was looking for a man, and it was similar to the prior posting about someone looking for a woman. Shockingly, all the information about the neighborhood where he lived and the appearance of him was all in accordance with me. He literally posted my approximate information on the website referring to my email address and my profile picture. He also said he would pay money to anyone who finds me. I'm so terrified. I feel like he'll find me and kill me someday. A few days ago, someone came and talked to me on the street. He was a stranger, but he stared at my face and tried to continue a meaningless conversation, so I had to run away. I think there are people looking for me to get that money. Now I can't go out of my house. I have to stay inside. Please, somebody help me.
All throughout the mid to late 90s, I spent my time alternating back and forth between my parents who had divorced when I was six. During the summer, I preferred staying at my dad's single-story ranch-style house in a quiet cul-de-sac as opposed to my mom's place in the city. My dad's place was much quieter and had a better feeling of privacy with its big, fenced-in backyard. During the warmer months, I would enjoy sleeping with my window cracked open and my fan on. In the city, it was always too noisy to have a window open at night. I remember at the time, my dad was usually working late and would arrive home around 8 p.m. or later. So the majority of the day I was alone. I would spend my time on my dad's computer, using the dial-up internet. Back in those days, if you wanted to use internet, you had to keep in mind that you were sacrificing your ability to use the phone. You also had to sit at a desk all day when you surfed the web. On this particular day, it was getting pretty late, and I had been sitting for a while. So I decided to get up and make myself a snack. The sunlight was fading outside, and it was just starting to get dark. But I didn't turn on any lights as I walked down the hallway and turned into the kitchen. Using the light from inside the fridge, I began to shuffle around looking for something to make a sandwich out of. When I heard something that made me pause. Back inside my room, I had a lamp on my nightstand that had these tiny charms hanging from the shade. Whenever I went to raise or lower my window, the nightstand would shake and the charms would make tiny wind chime type sounds. I was used to the sound, but I had never once heard it from outside my room, because I was the only one who ever touched my window. And for such a small sound, I was surprised how far it traveled. There was this animalistic moment where my entire body froze, and I felt my sense of hearing dial itself up to 11 as I strained to catch every small noise coming from my room. I heard a couple of footsteps on my carpet, some muffled voices and I heard the creak of my door opening. I let the fridge door swing shut and rushed over to the back door, but as soon as I opened it, I paused. Out the back door led to our screened-in back porch, which led outside to our fenced-in yard. Going through the screen door would make way too much noise, and whoever was now in the house would be able to catch me before I was able to unlock the gate to exit the backyard. I would have to run back towards the intruders to get to the front door, so not knowing what else to do, I ducked into a small closet right next to the fridge, where my dad kept the vacuum. There was barely enough room inside for me to stand up straight, and I knew that if they happened to open the door, I was caught. So I kept my hand on the doorknob to hold it closed. I heard two sets of footsteps walking down the front hall, and suddenly somebody was in the kitchen. He wasn't even being cautious. He was just sauntering around, opening cabinets and drawers like he belonged there. I heard him open the fridge right next to me and knock a few things around inside. I heard an annoyed voice coming from the hallway. What the hell are you doing? The second voice responded. I'm starving, man. I haven't eaten all day. Get the fuck out of there. The first voice snapped. The fridge door shut abruptly and suddenly there was a tug on the handle of the closet I was hiding in. I tensed, and I held the door latch firm. All the guy had to do was pull on it hard, and I would have toppled right onto the floor. Hey, this one's locked. The voice came from right outside the door. As soon as I heard it, I knew I was done, and I mentally prepared myself to be kidnapped or murdered. The second voice came again over by the back door. Hey, did you open this? No, why? And somebody was just here. They must have run out back. I heard both of the intruders run out to the back porch. I could have taken that moment to run. But I was shaking so hard at me nearly getting caught that I didn't trust myself to try and take a step. I thought about trying to go for the cordless phone on the counter, but I remembered the dial-up internet was still using the phone line. After another few moments, the two men ran back into the house and made for the front door. I heard the front door unlock and swing open. They hadn't been out of the house for more than five seconds before I heard a police siren wailing as it drove past the house. Turns out my neighbor had spotted the two men walking around outside and called the cops as soon as she noticed them opening my window from the outside. They were kids themselves, really. One was 18 and the other was 19. My dad arrived home shortly after and we ended up staying at my aunt's for the night. I was incredibly shaken for the next several days, 
and the smallest of noises made me anxious, and I was too afraid to be alone. Looking back now, those two kids likely would have taken off running if they had found me. They didn't even have any weapons on them. But at the time, I didn't know that, and the experience traumatized my tiny 11-year-old mind. Who would have thought on a quiet cul-de-sac with houses surrounding me on all sides, and the sun not even completely gone, that my house would be invaded? The city may be noisier, but at least at the time, it was safer. I was young and fresh out of high school. I needed work, so I sent in resumes to all sort of entry-level positions. I got a few responses. I settled on McDonald's because it was an easy commute. Plus, the employee discount was pretty cool. The only position they had was a night shift. 10pm to 6am. I'm fine with that, because I was already a night owl. The first few days working there were fine. I wasn't working the counter or anything, just doing back-end stuff and cleanup. Our building was in a little strip mall off a highway exit. It's the only place there that's open at night, but we get a decent amount of customers, most of which go through the drive through On the Friday of my second week working there, or maybe it was a really early Saturday morning at that point, I'm not sure, it was just late. I remember I was grabbing the stacked trays from the lobby when someone walked in through the doors. It was a woman. She was really tall and pretty, made up super fancy in a long dress with high heels. She was wearing a big hat too. Eccentric, not your average McDonald's customer. But what was weird was that I never saw a car pull up. We have a full view of the parking lot from the window, but no car ever dropped her off. She must have walked here. I smiled at her as I walked by and headed behind the counter. I bent down to restack the trays below, expecting my coworker standing at the register to serve her. He didn't say anything though, and after I'd finished, I stood up to find out why the girl wasn't ordering anything. But she wasn't there when I looked up. I never heard the door open, she was just gone. I asked the guy on the till where the girl went, and he replied, Who? I said the girl with the hat, and he just looked at me like I was dumb, telling me he had no clue who I was talking about. So I tried to rationalize it, deciding she had probably stepped in the door, took a look at our grubby menu, and left. But something was weird about the whole thing. It didn't really make sense why someone who looked and dressed like that would be at a random McDonald's in the middle of the night. Whatever. The shift went on normally for the next hour. Then I remember taking a break after cleaning the toilets. I sat down on a chair in the back near the kitchen when I heard heels clicking on the floor. It was quite audible, louder than if someone was just walking. It sounded like stomping, sort of. So I peer out into the lobby. My coworker was gone from the front. I figured he went to take his break, but you know who I do see? That same woman. Only this time someone was with her. A man. He wore a tuxedo with fancy black shoes. They were dancing together, like full-on ballroom dancing in the lobby. Swinging back and forth, it was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. I remember watching them for a bit, mesmerized, before I took my place behind the register. I said something along the lines of, uh, can I help you? They both looked at me at the same time. As they stared, I felt a hand grab my shoulder with a firm grip. Instinctually, I turned around. No one was there. I knew someone had touched me, but there wasn't anyone, so I spun back to the lobby where the people were, to find them both gone. The man and the woman had just vanished. Once again, I didn't hear doors open or close. I didn't hear their fancy shoes skid on the floor. 
They were just there one minute and gone the next. For the rest of the night, only a few small things happened. At one point, I walked by the washrooms on my way to do something, to find both doors swinging, the male and female ones, like someone had just crashed through both of them. A little while later, I remember looking for something on the shelves in the back near the employee entrance, and something banged on the door, hard. Something heavy hit it, and only once. I remember opening it, looking around, and seeing no one. After that, the shift was regular. Really not much to say. I was really happy when I finally got off, though. The first bits of sunlight had just begun to come over the horizon as I left for my car. I was punching out ten minutes before I was supposed to, but I didn't think the people coming in would care. As I hit the parking lot, though, I see a car. It looked like a small limousine. It was just sitting there in front of the restaurant. Through the light from the street lamp, I could make out the doors opening. Two people got out, one on each side of the car. It was the man and the woman I'd seen before. The same people that were dancing. Only their appearance had changed. Their clothes seemed torn and ragged. I could see the woman's dress clearly because it was white. It was covered in dirt with holes and tears. And their faces... Their faces were terrifying, their skin was bleach white, and their eyes, which were previously normal, were this beady black, like oversized bugs were looking at me. I stood there, frozen as I looked at them. Then the man spoke in a deep, filtered voice that seemed to echo from all around me. Would you like a ride? We have room for one more. Shaking my head was all I could muster. Without another word, the two people, if you can call them that, got into their car, shut the doors, and pulled away. None of their lights were on. I watched wide-eyed as the limo drove down the road before disappearing into the darkness of the early morning. Back in the late 90s, I used to have a serious drug problem. I was living in Las Vegas at the time, and after snorting my entire stash of coke, I would party, pass out, wake up, jack some cars, sell them, spend some money on food, and the rest would go to my dealer, and then I would snort again and repeat the entire process. One night in July, I broke into a panel van without windows. It was parked alone outside of a rat-infested motel. My gut told me that I should check the back before I drove away, but my mind was on my next fix, and I just floored it as soon as I got the engine started. I drove about an hour away into an isolated area of the desert, where I would meet my contact, who would check out the car, pay me in cash, and then drop me off at the nearest street corner. Once I put the van in park, I decided to check out the back. I figured there might be some tools or something back there that I could pawn for more cash. The back of the van was padlocked shut, which should have been my first clue, because when I smashed it open with my crowbar, I heard a high-pitched wailing from inside. I turned on my flashlight, and my stomach dropped. Four Hispanic children, two boys and two girls, were tied up and gagged, lying on a handful of filthy cushions. They were all in tears and staring at me in absolute horror. I dropped the crowbar and backed away from the van a few steps. This was bad. Really fucking bad. I didn't know what to do. I had clearly stolen the van from a kidnapper or a human trafficker, and they would be looking to recover it, and likely shoot the asshole who took it from them. I decided not to call my contact. I knew him pretty well, and I was fairly certain that he would either kill the kids and dump their bodies in the desert, or shoot me for fucking this up. I made a snap decision. I climbed in the van and explained to them in both English and what Spanish I knew that I wasn't going to hurt them 
I gagged them and cut the bonds around their wrists, but I left their ankles tied. I couldn't risk them running off. I felt sick to my stomach with heartbroken guilt when I saw the welts around their hands. The stench of urine and sweat was heavy in the air. I climbed back in the driver's seat, drove back out of the desert, and at the first service stop I pulled in and parked. I went inside and bought four bottles of water and as many bags of snacks that I could afford. I carefully opened the back of the van and tossed the bag inside. Then I closed it again and walked across the lot. I made an anonymous phone call to the police from a payphone and then walked to the next service station where I had a friend come pick me up. After that night, I had my friend buy me a bus ticket to Texas where I had an older brother who would let me stay on his couch. I got clean and I ultimately turned my life around. I got an honest job and I now have my own family and my own home. I remember being so relieved when I heard on the news that the kids had been found and were returned to their families in Mexico. You never know when life will give you a test like that and a chance to prove your character. I like to think that those kids helped me as much as I helped them. About five years ago, I worked at a job where I would finish late and end up driving home around one in the morning. Most of the route I took was in a countryside surrounded by woods. I drove past quite a few people who needed help, so I always had jumper cables, spare gas, and other tools I might need in my car. One rainy night, when I was driving home, I noticed a parked car on the side of the road with their hazard lights on. I pulled over in front of their car and got out to see what was the problem. When I got out, two young men in their 20s stepped out. I asked them what the problem was, and one of the men said their car wouldn't start and asked if I could help them. I don't know what it was, but I instantly felt on edge around these guys like I needed to be on guard or something. I asked one of them to open the hood. I expected one of them to go back in the car and pop the hood, however, one of them just sort of signaled someone in the car. That's when I really looked into the car and noticed there were two more people inside. That's when I felt like something was really wrong. I opened the hood and took a quick look. I noticed one of the men gave a nod to the other men in the car. I was believing my instincts at that point and that something bad was about to happen. I quickly thought up an excuse to get back into my car. I said to them that I think I knew what the problem was. I would just go back to my car and get the tool that I needed. I walked back to my car trying to look normal. I remember thinking one of the men was going to attack me from behind. When I got close to my car, I quickly got inside and started my car and drove away. I'm glad I knew it was a trap because shortly after, a car came speeding down the road behind me. Of course, it was the car claiming to be broken down. The man driving kept turning into my car almost making contact. One of the men opened their window and was throwing what I guess was loose change and junk at my car. The same guy throwing things then pulled out a knife and started scratching and stabbing at the windows, causing them to chip and crack. The driver turned his car into mine, this time making contact. I had to turn my car into theirs just so I wouldn't crash off the side of the road. I slammed on my brakes and so did they shortly after. The men then got out of the car and started running toward mine. At that point though, I had already started driving and drove past them in the car. I don't know if I lost them or if they just gave up, as I didn't see them again after that. I've never feared for my life as much as I did that moment. About three days later, I read on the news that two men had been robbed and severely beaten by a group of men who claimed that their car was broken down. I'm glad I trusted my instincts and knew to leave. This story happened about five years ago. My dad had recently retired and we had always talked about touring the United States. We bought a third hand RV and began our road trip around America. We were about halfway through our journey and so far we had no problems and enjoyed all the places we visited. The RV had a few problems being third hand, but nothing too serious that we couldn't fix on the side of the road. We were driving late in the evening around 10 o'clock when the RV started to make noises. That was usually an indication to us that we needed to get out and make a few adjustments. We pulled into a parking lot next to a bar and took a look and I suggested that we take a little break 
and had a drink in the bar. As we were walking towards the bar, I noticed there were motorcycles parked outside, and it actually looked like a motorcycle gang was hanging around. We were in the bar and we had some food and drinks. At one point, I looked around the bar and I noticed two men in, who were in motorcycle jackets pointing in our direction. The two men approached us and aggressively told us that we were in their parking spot and needed to move. I knew my dad was going to say something, but I interrupted him before he could speak and said to the two men that we'll move our RV. I wasn't going to cause trouble. These men looked dangerous and there were more outside. We paid the bill and we left the bar. As we were outside, I remember that we hadn't quite fixed the RV yet. I told my dad to wait inside and I will finish adjusting the RV so we could get back on the road as soon as possible. One of the men who approached us earlier asked why we weren't gone yet. I told him that the RV had some problems and I needed to fix it. The man told me in a very stern voice that we better be gone in five minutes. He made a point of revealing his handgun as he said this. I quickly finished the RV and we got going again. While we were driving, I heard motorcycles loudly behind us. One bike sped up and got in front of us while the other one surrounded the RV. I didn't understand why they were after us. We did everything they said and they were still harassing us. I knew the men were armed and if we stopped, we were probably going to get hurt or worse. I told my dad to continue driving no matter what. I tried calling the police but I couldn't get through. My dad said just to keep calling them until they pick up, so that's what I continued to do. The RV started to make noises again, and it wasn't long before the engine cut out, and we had no choice but to stop. The men got off their bikes and started approaching the RV, but for some reason they quickly turned around, got on their bikes, and drove away. My dad pointed in front, and he said, there's the police. We saw flashing lights coming down the road. I got out on the side of the road just to try to stop the police car, but as it got closer, I saw it was an ambulance. The flashing blue and red lights were enough to scare the bikers away. Me and my dad decided to let it go. We fixed the RV and continued our trip. I'm to this day grateful that the blue and red flashing lights saved me and my dad from probably death. This story happened a long time ago when I was in my late teens. I had recently got my first car and I would always drive my friends and I around, usually to a bar called Frank's Bar that our friend Peter's father owned. It had pool tables and darts there so that's where we hung out most of the time. One night like most nights I was driving some friends to the bar. During the drive, a man started driving close to my car, beeping his horn and trying to overtake me. One of my friends said to not let him over in order to annoy him. I didn't let him pass. My friends and I laughed at the man's frustration. For some reason, the man slammed on his brakes, nearly crashing into a barrier on the side of the road. We continued to laugh. Then we arrived at Frank's bar. We had dinner, played pool, and had a few drinks. As Peter's dad owned the bar, we would always stay late past closing time. My other friends had left a little earlier that night, so it was just me and Peter. It was midnight when I decided it was time to head home. I said bye to Peter and his dad, and I left the bar. When I got outside, I expected my car to be the only one in the parking lot, but there was another car parked near mine. A man was standing outside his car, sipping on a liquor bottle, watching me. I knew right away it was the man that nearly ran off the road. I kept my head down, trying not to make any eye contact, and I got into my car. When I got in and started my car, so did the man. I drove off down the road, and so did the man following me close behind. I barely got down the road when the man started aggressively tailgating me. He drove up beside me, waving his hands at me. It looked like he wanted me to pull over. I wasn't going to, and I continued driving and looked away. The man started beeping his horn, and when I looked back at him, he was holding a handgun, pointing it right at me. My instinct was to drive faster, and the man accelerated as well. I saw my mirror and the man somehow lost control of his car causing him to swerve. I didn't see what exactly happened as I was focusing on the road, concentrating to driving fast and to get away from this guy. I didn't see that man again that night and from then on, I always worried when I went back to Frank's bar that I would see that man again. 
Thankfully, I never did. When I was 10, my parents divorced. My mother left the house and disappeared. A few years later, my father married my stepmother. She was a very beautiful person and sweet as an angel to me. Being that she worked as a nurse, she used to take care of me whenever I got sick. I started to open up to her and it seemed like we were becoming a real family. Until an incident happened. About one year later, I started to get sick. It was weird. I could feel my body was getting weaker and weaker. As always, my stepmother took care of me with all of her heart. However, something felt different. Sitting next to me while I was laying in bed, she took something out of her bag. The first thing that caught my eye was a syringe. She said she would inject me with a tonic to get better soon. To this day, I get goosebumps whenever I think of what she said, and how she said it with a smile. I am an angel, and I'll send you to heaven. You won't hurt anymore. After hearing that, I refused it because it felt really weird. She then kept saying it was okay and even forcibly tried to give me the injection. You need a shot now! Being scared, I kept saying I didn't want it. I eventually jumped up from the bed and ran away. She then shouted loudly from behind, chasing me with a syringe in her hand. You can't go to heaven if you reject it like this! I ran away screaming like crazy. <coughs> Just then, my father came into my room when he heard my scream and shouted at her. She screamed and rushed at him. It's time for you to leave too! She then put the needle in his throat. However, he managed to block her and knock her to the floor just before she injected it into his body. Later, my father immediately called the police and she was arrested at the scene. Being terrified, there was nothing I could do but just flop on the floor. It turned out that she tried to inject us with a drug that kills people. The cops told me that if I had taken the shot, I'd probably be dead by now. The investigation found that she was suffering from severe depression and mental illness. Also, it turned out that she had been putting poison in the food which I ate over the past few weeks. In other words, I was dying slowly. I eventually recovered after the treatment, but I still suffer from the fear of that day. I'm sure you're all curious at this point, what could be the reason she tried to kill me? Well. I'm the one who's most curious about that reason. All I could say is that when she was taken away that day, she stared at me and hummed a song with a freakish, chilling smile. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. I'm just a normal guy in my mid-twenties. One day, one of my friends showed me a video that completely changed my whole life. Let me just begin my story. So, my friend was a bit of a weirdo. He would often save bizarre videos he found on the deep web on his phone and show them to me. At first, I was shocked that those things were real. On the other hand, the stimulating elements of the video strongly knocked on my brain. During a weekend, bored with nothing to do, I logged onto the deep website that my colleague told me about and watched a ton of horrible pictures and videos. I downloaded one of them, and to this day, it's still stuck in my memory. In the video, a man was sitting on the floor with his arms and legs tied with another man standing in front of him. I couldn't see his face because of the angle. Wearing a black suit, the man was muttering something. It was another language that I didn't understand. He seemed to be having conversations with the man sitting on the floor and soon walked off the screen. When he came back, he was holding a bucket. He then scattered some kind of liquid on his body. He turned around and made some gestures. What I saw next was terrible. Three hounds ran out from nowhere, quickly attacked the man and began to bite off his flesh. I'm not sure, but they look like some kind of wolves. 
The scene of three large-sized dogs eating him up was clearly visible on the screen. While watching the man's body being torn apart, I immediately closed the site and turned off my computer. I almost threw up on the spot. My heart was pounding frantically. I'd never seen anything like that in my whole life. The shock lasted for a few more days. The scene was imprinted in my head. I hadn't been on the deep web since that day, and I almost forgot about it. A few days later, a message popped up on my computer screen. If you want to live, send $6,666 to the account number below. If you don't send the money, we'll kill you like the man in the video you saw. We know where you are. My computer must have been hacked when I downloaded the video. I was terrified, but I tried to calm down thinking someone was just playing a prank on me. Only fools send money because of this shit. They don't know my location and will never hurt me. I turned off my computer and tried to forget everything after that. It had been three days and nothing happened. Yeah, it was just a prank, I told myself. That day, on the way home from work, I saw three large dog necklaces on my front porch. I found a note next to it and it said this on the paper. My dogs are starving. Just then, I broke out into a cold sweat. No way, do they really know where I live? There was another message on the screen when I immediately turned on my computer. If you don't send the money by today, you'll be the next target. Being scared, I collected all the money I had and sent it to him. You might be wondering why I didn't call the police. I just couldn't do that. I felt like they were watching me all the time. Outside my window, people who I'd never seen before were walking with a big dog, like some kind of shepherd. If it was any other day, I might have thought it was nothing, but I was extremely afraid back then. The next day after sending the money, he sent another message. This money is not enough to feed my starving dogs. I had no more money and I thought I would become their next prey. I ended up calling the police. They constantly threatened me and I was terrified, but fortunately nothing happened. Shortly after, police called me and said the criminals had been arrested. I decided to go to the police station and meet them. To my surprise, they were two young men in their early 20s. I felt like they were completely different people from the video I saw before. They just looked like young nerds who sat in front of a computer. I was so upset. I couldn't believe I was fooled by these guys. The case was eventually over and I was able to get back to my normal life. Or so I thought. The next day, the police suddenly contacted me. They said the hackers suddenly disappeared. I immediately had a bad feeling about it. Just in case, I accessed the deep web and found a new video. As soon as I clicked the video, I saw those hackers being eaten alive by three giant wolves. <coughs> After that day, I threw my computer away, moved to another place, and never accessed the deep web again. It happened a few years ago on Halloween. I was drinking and hanging out with my friends until late at night in a downtown club. All the clubs and streets were full of people dressed in Halloween costumes. Everyone was enjoying a crazy night. Because I drank too much, I ended up collapsing in a nearby alley and fell asleep. I don't remember how long I was passed out for, but when I opened my eyes, I felt someone rubbing something on my face. I opened my eyes and a man in a bloody vampire costume was putting something on my face. It smelled sour, and just then, I realized he was putting ketchup on me. I freaked out and pushed the man away. What are you doing? He began laughing frantically. <laughs> this is the only way no one will notice I stabbed you. <laughs> He sprinkled ketchup all over me, then suddenly took the knife out of his pocket. Damn it! I instinctively thought I was screwed. No one would ever notice if I was stabbed by this man in the alley. My extreme fear soon became a reality. 
He stabbed me in the stomach with the knife and I collapsed right there. While I was bleeding, he came towards me and continued to put ketchup on me. I couldn't distinguish the blood from the ketchup which covered my entire body. He kept laughing like crazy and putting ketchup on me. <laughs> then, a group of guys passed through the alley. Even though I was out of energy and couldn't move or speak loudly, I yelled as much as I could. Help me! As they glanced at me, the man in the vampire costume put his arms around my shoulder, smiled, and bit me like he was pulling a prank. The guys eventually passed by us smiling, and I thought I was done for. However, he ran away as soon as the guys left the alley. Sitting in pain, I was fortunately rescued by others passing by and able to get treatment at the hospital. I rarely drink alcohol after that day, and I don't go out to play on Halloween anymore. And I never, never eat ketchup again. One night, I heard some noise outside my front door. When I went to investigate, I saw a man's face through the door window. He looked very dirty, and there was drool running down his chin. He was staring at me, his heavy breathing fogging up the glass. He then started laughing and knocking on the door, frantically. I was thoroughly creeped out and rushed to call 911. The guy just kept banging on the door. When I looked again, I noticed he wasn't using his fists. He was using his head, slamming it against the window over and over and over. He kept at it, madly, almost the whole time while I was waiting for the police. The glass was starting to crack, and he was bleeding from his nose and forehead. Unfortunately, just before the police arrived, he left. I hoped that that would be the end of it, but no. Later that night, I woke up to a loud noise. It was the same guy, hitting his head on another window on my house. There were small shards of glass sticking out of his head. There was blood all over his face. The window was nearly completely shattered. Then, I noticed he was handcuffed. Perhaps he was a criminal who had gotten away from the police. I ended up calling the cops on the spot again and hid in the bathroom. The guy must have eventually ran out of windows to break and got into the house. He wound up behind the bathroom door and started slamming his head against it. I was afraid he'd break the door too. That's when I heard the sound of sirens. The police had arrived. The banging stopped. They found him collapsed in front of the bathroom door, with pieces of broken glass and splinters of wood stuck on his face. The man was immediately taken to the emergency room at the nearest hospital. However, he had suffered a serious concussion and other damage to his brain, and fell into a coma. He still has not awakened. Until he does, there will be no answers as to why he was banging his face on my door that night. I really like playing video games. Three years ago, I forgot about reality and lived in the game world. I wanted to go inside, decorating my character and thinking of it as me. I was obsessed with the world and the people I met in the game. But the truth is, I just wanted to escape reality. I didn't come out for a year, just played video games in my room. I was the perfect social misfit. Tons of trash was piling up on my desk and in my room. Even if I knew my mother was crying, I didn't go out. One day, I made a friend in the game. She seemed like a really sweet person. She bought me a nice item and understood me more than anyone else. It was the first time I met someone who was so nice to me. We quickly became close. Our relationship actually became more than friends. We spent all day together in the game and she became my first girlfriend in my entire life. I really loved her. Even though we hadn't actually met, I was happy. 
Then one day, she started attacking my character. I asked her why, but she didn't answer. She just kept attacking me. Another day, I got a phone call from her. I want to attack people, she said. But it's impossible in real life. So I want to at least feel it in the gaming world. Now, I'm going to attack your character. Scream for me, so I can feel like I'm really attacking you. <laughs> she started attacking my character and laughed frantically. I hung up the phone and couldn't get out of the shock. I kept getting calls from her, but didn't answer them. I then got a text message from her. I want something stronger. If you love me, die for me. I started to get scared of her, but I already liked her so much back then. I wanted to give her everything she wanted. The next day, she suddenly made a video call to me. Even though I had seen her picture before, she was even prettier on video. Compared to her, I was shabby. I was so embarrassed, but I didn't want to miss her. I wanted to be nice to her. Then, she suddenly told me to pick up a kitchen knife. Stab your belly when I attack your character, she said. I know, I thought it was ridiculous, but I said yes. I didn't want to disappoint her. I brought a small knife to the computer. I could see her eyes glittering. Just then, she attacked my character. She told me to stab myself in the stomach at the moment, but my hand wouldn't move. In great fear, my body wouldn't allow me to do such a thing. My body was shaking hard and I began to sweat. I thought what I was doing was crazy, but I was out of my mind. I could hear her over the phone shouting and cursing. Did you do it? No? Why? I said in tears on the spot. I can't, I can't do it. She kept saying. Do it for me, baby. You promised to make me happy. And this is what will make me happy. Just close your eyes and do it. And let me hear your painful groans. I tried again but failed. No matter how much I loved her, I couldn't do this. She started to curse at me again. We ended up arguing for hours on end. My body was all sweaty, and she said she wouldn't see me again if I didn't do it. I thought about hanging up the phone and breaking it off with her, but I was also afraid I would never see her again. After a few attempts, I stabbed myself with a kitchen knife when her character attacked me. <clears throat> a dizzying pain surged, and just then, I heard her laugh. You finally did it! <laughs> Watching me clench my stomach in pain, she laughed madly. I felt blood flowing down from my belly and my vision getting fuzzy. She smiled at the sight of me like that. This is thrilling! She hung up the call as I lost consciousness. When I opened my eyes again, I was lying in the hospital with my mother crying next to me. I finally came to my senses when I saw her tears. I did something really, really stupid. Fortunately, I didn't stab myself that deeply and was able to leave the hospital shortly after. As expected, there was no contact from her after. And after that day, I never contacted her again. That's how I got over the hard times and got back to my daily life. I'm living a normal social life now. I learned a lot from that terrible experience. Humans are weak beings. Human psychology is weaker than we think. And sometimes you can't think normally because you're being psychologically manipulated by someone else. I just hope there are no victims like me again. Two years ago, I met a man while I was taking a walk in the park in front of my house. He used to jog along the trail every day, and we would talk occasionally. Soon enough, we became friends. He seemed like a nice guy. Then one day, he came up to me and said, Hey, I have two kids and I'll be home late tomorrow. 
Could you take care of them? I'll give you $150. My kids can't eat their meals by themselves. After considering it for a while, I soon accepted it, thinking that I would make a decent amount of money. He gave me his address, and the next day, I headed over to his house. The exterior was just like any other house, but as soon as I opened the front door and entered inside, I screamed. Two people without arms and legs were sitting at the living room table. I was so surprised that I thought I had seen an illusion or something. When I came back to my senses, I could clearly see the dead bodies. Being shocked, my body couldn't move at all. There was also a note on the table which said, Please, take care of their meals. I could see there was toy tableware and some food on the table. Just then, I remembered what he said to me. His children couldn't eat by themselves. My legs were shaking, and I looked around the house. There was a chill in the air, and a disgusting stench pierced my nose. I don't know why, but next, I walked towards the refrigerator. I should have just run away at the time. I still regret the decision to investigate. When I opened the refrigerator, I could see lots of wrapped up arms and legs. They were piled on top of each other inside. Screaming, I fell backwards. Then I heard the front door open. When I looked back, the guy was approaching me with a chainsaw. He said, Now we have one more, kids! I was frozen with fear. However, I immediately took out the pepper spray I always carried in my pocket in preparation for the worst and sprayed it on his face. After turning on his chainsaw, he ran towards me, but then he got sprayed in his eyes and writhed. Ugh, my eyes! I managed to run away from his house and call the cops. He was immediately arrested on the spot. It turned out that the bodies were of those who were kidnapped and killed by him, their arms and legs severed by his chainsaw. What was even more horrifying was his response when the police asked him why he had cut off people's arms and legs. That way, I can carry them. Then he laughed maniacally. <laughs> to this day, I live every day grateful that I survived that crazy encounter. What would have happened to me if I couldn't escape from there?